Person, the Premier joins us on the Roy Green Show on the Coros Radio Network. Premier, thank you very much uh, for taking the time. And, and what is the energy emergency and how much of it falls at the feet of the current federal government? Well, what I, I called it an economic emergency here in Alberta, Roy, and a lot of it falls at the feet of the federal government. You and I have talked about this before. Uh, the latest job stats came out once again, Alberta, and, and after Newfoundland with the highest unemployment in the country, uh, with the Calgary and Edmonton, the highest urban unemployment in the country. The one thing that Alberta and Newfoundland have in common is that energy, uh, prim- primarily oil and gas, are the largest industries in those two provinces. And uh, uh, this past, I, when I said that, it was the day that Suncor, one of Canada's largest companies, announced 2,000 layoffs. Uh, those will almost all happen in Alberta, some in Newfoundland. Uh, and I pointed out, Roy, that if you could imagine a, a, a similar scale of layoffs from one large company in, let's say, Ontario, well, we had we had a couple of thousand layoffs announced. Uh, I think it was GM in, in uh, um, out in Oshawa about two years ago, and and quite rightly, that attracted national attention for the better part of a week. It became the number one issue, huge focus, and rightfully so. But Suncor laying off 2,000 people in Alberta, it would be the per capita equivalent of an auto company laying off 10,000 people in Ontario, and that's just one company here. We have nearly 300,000 unemployed people. That would be like, uh, as again, that's uh, times four, 1.2 million unemployed Ontarians. Imagine that. I just try to get the rest of the country to understand the scale of what is happening here uh, to a province that has been the great motor of job creation and wealth production and government revenues. 20% of government revenues come from oil and gas. So part of my message to the Prime Minister was this. With all of the borrowing and spending that you are doing, how is, are we as a country going to pay for it unless we get the energy sector off its knees and back into full production? So please stop, you know, get your foot off the throat of the oil and gas sector, allow us to get back up on our feet before imposing yet more damaging policies. Premier, what do you hear back when you deliver that message? And it's a legitimate message. The energy sector, the oil and gas industry could fuel so much, fund so much of our infrastructure, health care, social programs that Canadians hold so dear and are so significantly important to us. When you deliver that message to the Prime Minister of Canada, the current Prime Minister, what do you get back other than, you know, the, the proxy poetry of Seamus O'Regan? Well, when I talk to the Prime Minister about this, he says that he appreciates this, he understands this, he understands there has to be a future for oil and gas in Canada. And and, and I will say, uh, to the credit of uh, this government, they they did step in uh, to in, uh, purchase the Trans Mountain Pipeline Expansion Project from Kinder Morgan when they pulled out. But the deeper problem, the deeper problem is that they pulled out in the first place. They pulled out because of regulatory uncertainty. In particular, let me just focus on one example of these policies that are that are uh, a body blow to this, the largest industry in Canada. Uh, Karen Morgan pulled out because of uncertainty largely around Indigenous consultation. They saw it as just an endless uh, uh, kind of uh, Groundhog Day of recurring court fights and battles, and it was just never going to end because of uncertainty around what constitutes the government's duty to consult under Section 35 of the Constitution. That's why they pulled out. And that's ended up costing us as taxpayers at least $7 billion to buy the pipeline. So now, finally, finally, in February of this year, the Supreme Court of Canada gave us certainty uh, after 30 years of charter jurisprudence and litigation on the duty to consult Indigenous people, they gave us certainty in the decision on um, on, Keist- on uh, sorry, Trans Mountain, saying that the, that the Crown has discharged its duty to consult that and that not and that the, that no one First Nation has a veto right. And they pointed out that 121 of 128 affected First Nations support or do not oppose the project. It was critical stability. And now what's happening, the Prime Minister reconfirmed in the throne speech his commitment to legislate, uh, legislatively ratify the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. We all want to do so much better for our First Nations. I think the best way is economic development, including responsible resource development. But here's my point, Roy. That decision is going to radically change. It, it may hand a veto to any one small group.
So to answer your question, the prime minister says rhetorically he gets it, but in policy, it's just one thing after another. Premier, when you hear the Prime Minister, and I know you're not opposed to this, but I'm just curious how I'd, what your reaction is. When you hear Mr. Trudeau and Premier Ford of Ontario committing $250, $280 million each to Ford Canada for the development of electric cars and the batteries that will drive them, then you know what Alberta requires. How do you react to that? Yeah. Well, I... Uh, Exactly. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's it, like we have here. We have the largest industry in Canada, and by the way, there will be a massive global demand for oil and gas for decades to come. Even the biggest critics of the industry accept that as a fact. Uh, and because you're not going to have airplanes running on batteries, you're not going to have uh, huge industrial projects running on batteries anytime in the foreseeable future. Uh, but they will be running on oil and gas. Uh, well, you're not going to have the developing world, which is now burning uh, biomass like dung and and wood to heat their homes, to, to cook their dinners. You're not going to have the billions of people in the developing world suddenly living off of expensive battery uh, technology or driving Teslas. You're just not. They want to move up into the middle class, into a decent standard of living. They want to move from energy poverty to affordable, reliable, uh, and cleaner energy. And the single biggest thing we could do for them while reducing global greenhouse gas emissions simultaneously would be to get our, our, our natural gas to them, our liquefied natural gas. As you may recall the protests this past winter that just about shut down half the Canadian economy, that was over building a liquefied natural gas pipeline, which every elected First Nations Council between Alberta and B.C. supports. Here's my point. The batteries are not going to, uh, you know, we should pursue battery technology. Great. And we actually have, want to be part of that here in Alberta. We, we, we think we have some of the, the minerals could, could play a role in that. But there will still be people needing to move from energy poverty, out of energy poverty with affordable hydrocarbon energy. And we can be the providers. If it's not us, as I've said to you before, it's Putin's Russia and it's the OPEC dictatorships. That's not good for the environment and it's not, and it's terrible for global stability. Well, and we, as we've talked about many times, we still import hundreds of thousands, 700, 800,000 barrels of foreign oil every day to fuel the uh, the refineries in, in New Brunswick and Quebec when if we had a pipeline infrastructure, we could handle that internally in Canada and everyone in this nation would benefit. Well, we just had a refinery shut down in Newfoundland. That's right. Uh, hundreds of people laid off. And uh, by the way, I don't want to sound like I'm special pleading for Alberta because the impact on them has been proportionally even greater. Uh, here's my point. They're, they're not going to turn off all the cars and trucks and, 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 and stop burning fuel in, in Newfoundland. They're not going to just import. Now, they, of course, most of that feedstock did come, unfortunately, from foreign oil imports, much of it from OPEC countries. Now, it will be refined if you will come in to Newfoundland. Now, what is one of the reasons for that? Well, I believe it, it may be the clean fuel standards. This is another federal liberal policy, which will add uh, potentially um, uh, as much as 20 cents per per a uh, liter of, of pe fuel that people buy, and 3 to $4 per barrel of oil produced in the country for a trade-exposed sector. Now, what I'm trying to say is the refineries ar around the world in OPEC countries, um, they won't be imposing the clean fuel standards. They'll be able to produce 3 to $4 less expensively. That puts our industry at yet another competitive disadvantage. Here's my point. We're not asking for bailouts. We're not asking the feds to write us uh, uh, some kind of a, a subsidy to oil and gas. We're asking them to spend no money, just hit the pause button at least for a couple of years on policies like the clean fuel standard, like Bill C-69 environmental reviews, like legislative ratification of the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, and a bunch of other things. We've given them the list. And that could allow our industry to get off its feet from the COVID crisis, bring some investment back, 
hire uh, start hiring people again, and then eventually, hopefully, you're right, Roy, that when the price recovers, we can get something like Energy East done and displace foreign oil imports from Eastern Canada. Yeah. Premier, I have one more question for you, and it doesn't have anything to do specifically with uh, with energy, but it's significant. Your government will not follow Quebec and Ontario with a return to COVID lockdowns. Voluntary measures for Edmonton, but not province-wide mandated. Speak to that, please. Yeah. Um, Roy, I, I, our view is that the most effective approach to COVID is educating the public and encouraging people to exercise personal responsibility and common sense to limit the spread, but that we must, those of us in leadership, must not focus exclusively on the question of COVID-19 viral spread. We need to have a broader perspective on the uh, social, economic, physical, and mental and emotional health of our societies, and to constantly uh, uh, push new uh, job-killing restrictions on the economy, um, indiscriminately shutting down tens of thousands of businesses, risks economic devastation. We're already coping with, as I've said, an economic emergency here. To make that even worse, with large and, and unpredictable interruption in economic life, uh, I, I am very afraid of what the long-term consequences of that will be, the non-COVID-related health consequences, the mental health and emotional health consequences. The, we, we've already seen part of that, Roy. We've got some data, and that is on opioid overdoses. In Alberta, we've had 450 opioid deaths uh, so far this year versus, I believe, 285 COVID-19 deaths. That the opioid overdoses have more than tripled in our province during the COVID era. And there's complex reasons, but they're all connected to what's happened in this time. And so our point in going forward as much as humanly possible would be to focus on uh, voluntary measures, on pers encouraging personal responsibility and public education. Um, and by the way, even the World Health Organization this weekend has said that uh, lockdowns are not a responsible policy response that they were necessary perhaps at the beginning to flatten the curve, to increase the capacity of our healthcare system to cope. And we have done that very successfully right. in Alberta. So that is our approach, and, and we hope as much as possible to, to stay within those parameters. Premier, good talking to you. Thank you for the time today. Thanks, Rob. Premier Jason Kenney of Alberta on the Roy Green Show on the Chorus Radio Network. Now, when we come back, we'll have a couple of minutes. So I'd like to just ask Alberta callers. If you're in Alberta, only 1-800-263-2428, 1-800-263-2428.